The local evening news is brought to you by Nagico, local agents, Bryson's Insurance. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for the evening news here in ABS, the region's news leader. My name is Garfield Burford. And I'm Terry Andrew. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday night. Antigua and Barbuda now has 120 active cases of COVID-19 after 17 new cases were confirmed as at 6 p.m. on Saturday, February 6th. The health ministry says 11 of the new infections were recorded from tests on a batch of 255 samples at the Mount St. John's Medical Center. That's right. The other six positive results came from tests on 71 samples at the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA. 15 of the 17 new cases are non-imported. The other two are imported. 28 of the country's 120 active cases remain in hospital. The country's case count now stands at 316 while there have been two more recoveries pushing that figure to 189. The number of those tested has crossed the 10,000 mark, totaling 10,281. Meanwhile, 244 people are now in self-quarantine, government quarantine. That figure stands at 19. Meanwhile, Tara, we can now get an update on the public health care system and how it's managing and the higher number of people in hospital. Yeah, the latest dashboard shows 28 people have been hospitalized after being infected with COVID-19. So, Doctor, the medical director of the Lance St. John's Medical Center, Dr. Albert Duncan, says health officials are on top of the situation, having made meticulous preparations. He joins us via Zoom to discuss this situation. Good evening, Dr. Duncan. Thank you so much for joining us via Zoom. Uh, is the figure for hospitalization still at 28? as we speak and how are they distributed across the infectious disease control center the idc and the mount st john's medical center Hi, good evening to you uh, gary we have uh, a total of uh, 16 people in the idc we have five people in the icu we have the COVID ward that we just established we have a total of uh, uh, 14 people on that ward and the ER has four people in the ER at the present time. Uh, so those are the total in the those are the totals in the hospital. Now these totals are comprised of people who are confirmed by PCR and people who only have antigen tests. At the present time, we have 33 patients that are hospitalized in somewhere in the hospital system between the IDC and the hospital proper that are confirmed, and seven patients that are waiting for confirmation. So that brings us to a total of 40 people in the Mount St. John Hospital system at this time. All right, Dr. Duncan, uh, what is the condition of these individuals? Uh, the people in the ICU, as, as you could imagine, are, are seriously ill. We have a total of three out of four people in the ICU uh, and the res respirator. And one person is receiving CPAP, which is a, a form of uh, oxygen therapy without the use of the ventilators. Uh, the other folks are between moderate to mild. Uh, most of the patients presently now in the uh, IDC has down, been downstage to mild disease, a total of 11 out of 16. The other five are moderate. And the patients in the hospital, uh, they're relatively new collection in the hospital with some of the results just coming out uh, from the lab. And we have, for the most part, uh, in, that, in that unit has about 18 people and about uh, three people are considered moderate and the rest are considered mild. Mm. And are you satisfied, Dr. Duncan, that all is in place to deal with any increase in hospitalizations if that were to happen? Uh, hopefully, and everybody hopes that that doesn't happen. If it does, are you satisfied all is in place to manage that? Yeah, very much so. Um, the, the hospital, we, we are equipped to take some more people on in the hospital itself at Mount St. John based on the arrangements we have made. And at this time, we are speculating that we can probably manage about 50 people in the hospital environment uh, as it is right now. Uh, the more the patients become severely ill, then we will be challenged from a human resource point of view because we need people to run the ventilators and uh, do the critical care. Right now, we're able to cope with what we're having uh, in terms of critical care and the manpower. Uh, we are having some trouble. Some people are not well. Some people have been sick and so forth. So that is putting a little strain on the system. But right now, we're managing very well. And we just have to decide to share the resources where they're needed. 
Mm. And in relation to, as you, see, you were talking about some of the arrangements that you've made at the Mount St. John's Medical Center, could you talk about uh, that level of preparation that you would have made to ensure that all is in place at the Mount St. John's Medical Center? Well, uh, if you were to start from the entrance into the hospital system, we have a respiratory tent where patients are evaluated and those that are suspected based on their symptoms and their complaints, we then be able to test them with the antigen test almost immediately and get an answer back immediately and they become suspect patients. If, this, if the symptoms are mild, these patients can be discharged to self-quarantine, to isolate at home if, there's a, if the facilities at home would allow them to do that. If the symptoms are moderate or there's respiratory distress vis-a-vis -vis the oxygen saturation levels are a little bit below 92, we, those patients will be hospitalized in, in the hospital. And so from that, past, that, that point of view in the ER, goes to the, if they go to the, the floor to be, uh, to be uh, isolated on the floor, we, just, we have people in the IDC now that are 16 that's full, so there's no capacity over there and they will have to come into Mount St. John and the COVID side of the hospital ward. We have stopped all the elective surgeries in the hospital. So we have reserved those beds that we were doing elective surgery on to keep the non-COVID medical patients on. And as a result of that, we were able to come up with about 60 beds that will be available for COVID patients on the medical side of the, of the, the hospital. All right, Dr. Duncan, just before we let you go here, uh, your advice to the general public tonight? Well, I, I think the, the best advice we can do, we can give now is what I've uh, been told about, told to the country for quite some time. Self, social distancing, very important. Uh, hand washing, very important. Uh, stop congregating uh, in, in groups, whether to have a private party or not, very important. And certainly wear the mask, but not just wear the mask, wear the correct mask and wear it properly. It must cover your nose and your mouth. So those are the things that the public can do to keep everybody safe. Just stay away from crowds uh, and follow the rules that are set out by both the, the cabinet and the medical uh, folks at Mount St. John. All right, Dr. Duncan, we're going to have to leave it there for now. Thank you so much for joining us here on the ABS Evening News. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thanks. All right, medical director of the Mount St. John's Medical Center, Dr. Albert Duncan, giving us an update there. In more news here for us, uh, KFC closed its Fort Road location today due to a suspected COVID-19 infection. The eateries management says those who were in reasonable contact have been quarantined and contact tracing is ongoing. The restaurant is sanitized daily. However, management says out of, a, out of an abundance of caution and in line with health protocols, the establishment will be fully sanitized today. A new team uh, unaffected by the development is being put in place. The public will be advised as to when and how service will continue from the location. According to management, the company's primary focus is the safety of its employees and customers. A celebrate this developing story. Attorney General and Legal Affairs Minister, the Honorable Stedroy Benjamin, says moves are afoot to ensure greater accountability for news outlets, especially when they publish defamatory material. We're going to be served the law and make all these news agencies, breaking news, this news, that news, let them, if the publication originated and taken by Buddha, let them be registered. So when you malign and you defame people, you must be sued and paid for your indiscretions. The Attorney General says his team is working on legislation which encourages responsible journalism, but which punishes reckless journalism. Fair, fair comment is not a problem. Qualified privilege is not a problem. But where you make a publication in a newspaper or any article designed to undermine the integrity of persons in the society, willfully, maliciously, recklessly, without any regard to the truth, then you ought to be made to pay for it. The Attorney General speaking today in Parliament during the budget debate. Also in more news from Parliament, Member of Parliament for St. Mary's South, the Honourable Samantha Marshall made a fiery presentation in the lower house questioning the work of the Barbuda Member of Parliament, Trevor Walker. Minister Marshall also holds the ministerial portfolio for agriculture, fisheries and Barbuda affairs. ABS's Jessica Russell covered the proceedings at the Parliament today. You will hear Barbuda complain 
They don't get no money. <coughs> From 2020, they received 5 million 700,000 from the Treasury here in Antigua. Member of Parliament for St. Mary's South, Samantha Marshall, says the Barbuda Council has gotten most of the $6 million owed to it from the central government. She says Member of Parliament for Barbuda, Trevor Walker, is guilty of political grandstanding. She says before Barbudans vote, they should ask this. The people of Barbuda must ask the Honorable Member for Barbuda, what have you done? What ideas have you come with to empower us? The MP, who is also Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and the Barbuda Affairs, says there are opportunities available on the Sister Isle. She mentions the peace, love and happiness luxury development, which has been vehemently opposed by Walker. You have the Entrepreneurial Development Fund. Have you recommended one Barbudan to that fund? development you're gonna need additional support services you ever looked at that they have pool down there you tell Bob you don't go where to learn to manage and clean pool and stuff like that and manage that a big money out of that now she says Walker could also help Bob access funds for business ventures need material building materials down there you go and tell a Bob you don't hey you should open my hardware store Man, let we go and get the Entrepreneurial Development Fund. You're saying afraid. You're saying afraid, Gaston Brown. So you walk them in a Gaston Brown office and say, this is what me want for them bad them, yeah. Also from the lower house today, as you know, the appropriations bill for 2021 seeks to legislate the government's proposed $1.4 billion budget. But opposition leader Jamal Pringle says the plan lacks hope and empathy. Here again is Jessica Russell. At a time like this, all the Minister of Finance can talk about is the plan to collect more taxes and punish those who do not comply. During today's debate on the appropriations bill, opposition leader Jamal Pringle said the government's plans fall short. Prime Minister Gaston Brown, who's also finance minister, unveiled this year's $1.4 billion budget in late January. While there are no new taxes, there are plans to improve tax collection. It is instructive that after abolishing personal income tax, which targeted only the high income earners, government is now accusing those who gain greater individual prosperity of being tax treats. Pringle also says the government has failed to present an avenue for upward mobility. What we call the grassroots, Mr. Speaker, now have no safe ladder to climb into the middle class. He says the government is complicit in crippling small businesses. I can tell you firsthand the significant amount of money is owed to small businesses is by the government itself. When the finance minister noted that the government, the government spent 83 million less than it had budgeted for 2020, who do you think was affected, Mr. Speaker? It was a small business they choose not to pay. The Member of Parliament for All Saints East and St. Luke also criticised the government over the plight of former Liat staff. Apart from a small paragraph where the government pledges to do all in its power to address the legitimate concern of the severed Liat workers, there is no mention of any plan to pay. Only what the Prime Minister insists on calling a compassionate payment to them. The Administrator Mr. Cleveland Seafoot has acknowledged that the severed workers have a legal expectation to be paid their benefits. The government has moved to restructure the airline that has been struggling financially. Jessica Russell, ABS News. Now there's news from the court. Uh, the Court of Appeal has ordered Washington Bramble to pay fines totaling $1,000 for to the 2016 convictions. Police charged Bramble with six offences after the appellant left a vehicle in the street to chase a boy with a Guinness bottle. At the magistrate's court, the appellant initially pleaded not guilty to dangerous driving, willfully obstructing traffic, and being armed with an offensive weapon. Now, Bramble also denied offences of failure to comply with a police officer's orders, making use of indecent language and making use of threatening language. 
court records show prosecutors withdrew the charge of dangerous driving at trial, and Bramble pleaded guilty to willfully obstructing traffic and making use of indecent language. The court later found the appellant guilty of being armed with an offensive weapon and making use of threatening language. Bramble, who was unrepre unrepresented at the Zoom hearing today, cited two grounds for the appeal. Firstly, the 40-year-old appellant claimed illegal evidence was submitted at the trial, and if removed, the remaining evidence could not sustain the convictions. Secondly, Bramble argued the magistrate's decision to convict was unreasonable, giving the evidence. Director of Public Prosecution Anthony Armstrong conceded the, the arm the wit offensive weapon charge was not made out since a Guinness bottle does not fall within the legal definition of an offensive weapon. On the other hand, uh, the DPP condemns Bramble's assertions that the prosecutor fabricated evidence and the court records were false. The Court of Appeal quashed uh, the armed with offensive weapon conviction and upheld the others. This means Bramble must pay $250 each for four offenses. Staying with news from the court because the Court of Appeal today quashed Randy Edwards' six-and-a-half-year manslaughter sentence and imposed a harsher penalty. In 2016, police charged Edwards with murder for killing Elvis Daisy. Daisy had touched Edwards' girlfriend inappropriately twice and shoved her to the ground while holding Edwards' son. Now, in a fit of anger, Edwards went to his grandmother's house for a cutlass and chopped Daisy in his head. After inflicting the wound, Edwards reportedly ran after the victim, shouting he would kill him. Daisy died of complications almost eight months later. In 2019, prosecutors accepted a manslaughter plea since the deceased had provoked the respondent. However, Director of Public Prosecutions Anthony Armstrong appealed the trial judge's sentence, arguing it was too lenient. Today, Crown Counsel Shannon Jones-Gittens explained the judge erred at arriving at the starting point and didn't consider aggravating factors when, when calculating the sentence. She says the judge also misdirected himself when he reduced the sentence because the respondent's mother assisted in Daisy's care before he died. The Court of Appeal agreed and sentenced Edwards to 11 years, one month after subtracting time served on remand. The justices of appeal began with a starting sentence of 15 years. They adjusted the sentence upwards for aggravating factors Included how, including how Edwards committed the offense and because he was on bail for another violent crime. The justices then applied the usual one-third discount for his guilty plea. Attorney Lawrence Daniel represented the respondent at the hearing. We're keeping across more stories for you this evening. Stick around because when we come back from this break, more of the stories that we're tracking here on ABS, the region's news leader, including this one. An update on remote learning as we speak with two principals. Plus, we'll also tell you about another story that we're tracking. Uh, Education Minister commends the nation's teachers. We'll tell you what he had to say as he addressed his uh, colleague, Ministers of Education in the OACS. Stick around. Much more after this. At Najico, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like your boat when you're at sea and you get away from everything. Your home and the security of your daughter's things. And the car that you've had for too long. But after all these years, you just can't let go. At Nagico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. Meet Crutches. Crutches painted his house with Sherwin-Williams paints. Unlike his neighbors, Crutches saves money by not having to repaint his house every year, which gives him more time for things like vacation. In fact, here he is now laid up on a beach in Honolulu with two hugs. Whoops, family. I, I meant family. While his neighbors are painting with who knows what. See what over 150 years of innovation can do for you. Bring your home to life with the very best paints. Only at Sherwin-Williams. Can you fix my laptop? Yes, we can. OMG. Yes, we can. My phone broke. Yes, we can. And my TV. Yes, we can. Need a website? Yes, we can. Networking? Yes, we can. Just call us? Yes, we can. Whenever you need. At Digicom, yes, we can. Your ultimate IT solution for computer and mobile repairs, networking, surveillance systems, software and app design, IT support, and more. Digicom, located at number four Linji's Complex Utility Drive. We're open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Call our office today, 773-3444. Digicom, IT simplified.
The Valentine sale continues at top ranking on the Old Palm Road. Up to 35% discount on Valentine gifts and accessories. Just arrived. Ladies lingerie in many designs. Say I love you with a Valentine gift basket. Mugs, vases, new arrivals include Valentine teddy bears in different sizes, a wide assortment of Valentine chocolates, roses, and floral arrangements. We also have costume jewelry, perfume, and cologne sets. You will find something for everyone. Join us on Saturday, 13th February, for our Customer Appreciation Day, where we want to show you how much we care. All COVID-19 protocols will be observed. At top ranking, high prices always get a spanking. Janserve is committed to keeping Antigua and Barbuda safe with our mass sanitization program. Our methods are safe, effective, and efficient, and eliminate pathogens, mold, bacteria, and viruses, especially COVID-19. We are introducing the EPA-approved Victory Innovations Electrostatic Sprayer and Vital Oxide Disinfecting Sanitizer. Our solution is even safe to use around children. It's odorless, easy to use, and will disinfect areas and surfaces for up to five to seven days, depending on application. The electrostatic sprayer atomizes the molecules of the vital oxide to adhere itself to all surfaces. It's much more effective than wiping. We are committed to using the most advanced sanitization methods for the safety and health of everyone. For the cleanest clean, contact JanServe today. JanServe is a service mark of the Akima Group Incorporated. Mark, now in this update on the story we have been closely tracking, uh, well, schools across the country have been providing support to students during this period of remote learning until the resumption of in-person classes later this month. Cheryl and Beezer gauged reactions from two principals on how they are making it easier for students. Principal of the Antigua Grammar School, Sam Roberts, says the subject offerings have been divided into two. So if you're doing 12 subjects, you'd have six of your teachers are responsible for posting work to you from Monday at 8 a.m. to Wednesday at 1 p.m. From Wednesday at 1 p.m. to Friday at 5 p.m., the next half of your teachers will be posting. Roberts explains arrangements are being made for students who don't have internet. If you do not have an internet connection or it, it is that you cannot submit work via classroom, uh, you can call the school and leave a note with the secretaries and then your te the teachers can email the work to the school where packages can be prepared for the students. For fifth formers completing school-based assessments that cannot be done remotely, the AGS principal says arrangements will be made for only those students to be on the compound. Meanwhile, principal of Princess Margaret, Dr. Colin Green, says teachers engage students online at the time the physical classes would have taken place. If you have a class at 8.30, your first class at 8.30, you go on to the system at 8.30. The students are expected to log on at the same time for the period. So if you have a double period, the teachers will be engaged with them for that period. Dr. Green says there's also a support team whose members track students and address difficulties they may encounter. The PMS principal encourages students to log on and parents to provide support. Dr. Green explains what's being done to assist the students without devices. We have done a survey to see how many students do not have devices. And we are working along with parents to, 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 to try our best to, 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 to overcome some of those challenges. He says they should have internet access from previous arrangements made with internet providers to make platforms available for students free of charge. Regarding the completion of SBAs, Dr. Green says a deadline was set for submission for the end of December last year, and approximately 98% have been submitted. He says SBAs for the practical subjects can be arranged at a later date. Cheryl Inby is reporting for ABS News. Equally important, Education Minister the Honorable Darrell Matthew uh, has praised the nation's teachers. He did so during the first meeting with sub-regional counterparts since taking on the education portfolio. 
Now, at the closing ceremony of the OECS's sixth annual Council of Ministers of Education meeting, Minister Matthew says now more than ever, the country's teachers are particularly deserving of the commendation. Here are excerpts of the minister's comments. I believe that the last 10 months have really brought out the best in our educators. And it is through their hard work that our young people, our students, continue to receive the instruction that is so vital to their growth and development. And so at this press conference, I would just like to commend them, to celebrate them, and to encourage them to continue to do the hard work that they've been doing and to continue to make us all proud. It is on their shoulders that we stand in the educational sector here today. We should tell you on a programming note as well that coming up right after the ABS Evening News, we'll still stay on the issue of education because we'll be uh, showing a video that will be especially useful to parents because we'll be doing training, a tutorial essentially, on using the Google Classroom. So stick around for that coming up right after the ABS Evening News. All right, look out for that. Another story that we're tracking, this time last year, then five-year-old Kasim Mapp Jr. was preparing for life-changing surgery in Trinidad and Tobago. A tumor which had developed on his skull left him drained and weak. ABS is Rakib Aparicio has an update on Kasim's journey a year on from his successful surgery. In the fourth of this month, I gave him a second checkup at the doctor. And from the report that I have received from the doctor, he's recovering very, 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 very nicely. Kasim Mapp Sr. providing an update on his son, Kasim Mapp Jr. Mapp says his family knew something was wrong when his son began suffering from severe intermittent headaches. You know, the headache had constantly been coming rapidly, and every time the headache come, he chose up. In January 2020, at only five years old, the young man was diagnosed with posterior fossa. A tumor had developed at the bottom of his skull. I don't know how others would have been feeling, but I didn't panic. I didn't budge. I just kept my trust and faith in God. Immediately, his family leapt into action and raised funds for his surgery. We just prayed for him and wish all the best that everything will come true. The procedure to remove the tumor would cost his family a minimum of 25,000 US dollars. Not long after the diagnosis, Wishing Well Foundation came forward and covered the costs in full. On February 18, 2020, just seven days after his sixth birthday, Kasim went into surgery. His father proudly declares the surgery a success. The headaches, he says, are a thing of the past. Before the surgery, when riding his bike, he used to fall down a lot. Now after the surgery, it seems to us as if he is getting back his balance. Kasim now wears the scars of his surgery, a testament of his strength and resilience. Rakib Aparicio reporting for ABS News. In another story, we learned here today that three-week-old Cairo Spencer has died. The infant diagnosed with small bowel or intestinal treasure died at 2.05 a.m. this morning at the Bustamante Hospital for Children in Jamaica. He was flown out via a ambulance for surgery in Jamaica Saturday and admitted to hospital that evening. Cairo's mother, Josette James, who accompanied the infant, says he developed an infection prior to traveling, which was treated. She said Cairo developed complications upon being admitted to Bustamante. James says she's heartbroken and just wants to return home to her family. She says his father, Tarek Spencer, is putting on a brave front. Cairo's uncle, Colson James, who arranged the sponsorship of travel and medical expenses, says this is not the news they wanted to hear. He, however, thanks the Calvin Air Foundation for their generosity, having donated 62,327 Eastern Caribbean dollars. Cairo's condition meant he had not eaten since birth and often regurgitated any food given to him by uh, intravenous methods. Meanwhile, the Calvin Air Foundation's executive director, Karina Delowski, is expressing deepest condolences on behalf of the foundation and the entire air group to baby Cairo's parents. Well, executive director of the Environmental Awareness Group, EAG, Erika Hill, has unveiled a new logo for the organization. Hill says the logo speaks to the long-standing mandate of the Environmental Conservation Group. Even though we have been around for just about 30 years, we want to demonstrate.
demonstrate to people that we are constantly changing to match our changing times. And our logo is representative of that. She says much thought went into the design. It encapsulates the length and breadth of the organization's reach. If you see that beautiful serpentine look of the logo, it focuses on our target species, which is the Antiguan racer. It also kind of touches on the, the marine focus, which is our sea turtle program, which has been going on for quite some time. It focuses on the fact that we do work on the land and specifically, you know, we've done work on the offshore islands. We've been doing work with the Antiguan racer on Redonda and so many different plates, so many small islands around Antigua. And that we also do work in the air, which is why you have those feathers at the end. Hill says the work of the organization is continuing despite the effects of COVID-19, albeit with Without the physical presence of students and the general public we wish them well when we come back we'll turn our attention to news overseas one of the stories that we're tracking for you very closely is an update from Montserrat because it has confirmed well another test positive for COVID-19 we'll update you from Montserrat plus we'll also tell you about Barbados that video that you were just showing seeing uh, let's go back to that because we'll update you on Barbados expected to receive significant numbers of AstraZeneca vaccines later and of course internationally we have an update uh, from Dr Fauci uh, he has a caution 